So, a uh, welcome back to our sixth session um, con uh, around the question of uh, disabilities and weaknesses. Uh, my name is Isabel Grimm. I'm moderating instead of Professor Schreiner, who uh, is a little bit out of voice. So, I try to keep up and uh, I have the pleasure to uh, welcome as the first speaker in this session uh, Professor Yanis Xidopoulos from the Aristoteles University in Thessaloniki. And he uh, poses the question whether Philip III Aridaeus, king of Macedonia, was a puppet king. Uh, Professor Xidopoulos, uh, the screen is all yours. If you want to share the screen or uh, start your presentation. Thank you very much. I don't know if you have, if you now see my uh, screen. Now we can see your, um, you, but not your screen. I think you should start uh, sharing the screen first. Well, there's a button at the lower row of the Zoom interface, share screen. It might be green. Yes, it is green, but... And then you click on it and you select an open window, probably PowerPoint, and yes. click share. I've done this, but uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't see any result. Uh, did you uh, did you open uh, the PowerPoint before you start? Yes. Uh -huh. Shall I close it and open it again? Yes. Try. Uh, maybe it might uh, it might work. And if it doesn't, you can email it to us, and we'll open it on our side. Okay. Sorry for this. <clears throat> No, unfortunately, we cannot see the shared screen. No. Anyway, uh, in order not to lose uh, time, I will uh, put on the chat my, or perhaps I could be a co-host in order to Share screen. Yes, maybe this might be the solution. Maybe you should be co-host and so on. Uh, and then it, uh, it might Let be. Let me try. Yeah. You should be co-host now. Thank you. <laughs> No, still nothing. So, just to double check if we're doing everything. So, when you click share screen, you get the selection of the windows that are open on your computer at the moment, right? And you can then select the open PowerPoint and click on the blue share. <laughs> what happens when you try that? Do you get some sort of error? Yes. Anyway. Uh, it was just uh, the sources, so I will, uh, as I said, I will spare you from the trouble and time and uh, just go on with my presentation. Uh, I'm sorry for this. My, the title of my presentation was Philip uh, III, a puppet king, question mark. After reading the sources, which unfortunately you cannot see, uh, I have removed the question mark because uh, I've came to the resolution that Philip III, surnamed Arideos, was uh, definitely unable to rule, unfit to rule. Historians have ignored Philip Arideos, the half brother and successor of Alexander the Great, because his mental disability led the Macedonian elite to consider him incapable of independent rule. Let me remind you here that Alex, Philip III, Arideus, was king of Macedonia 
from 323 to 317 BC. These are the words of Beth Carney's 2001 paper on Philip Arideus, entitled The Trouble with Philip Arideus. In another paper of 1984, that of William Greenwald, the American author tried to shed some light in this somehow obscure figure. He emphasized the lack of evidence regarding his childhood, as well as the hostile tradition of the... <clears throat> Today, I will focus on the information derived by the sources to examine whether one can reassess Aridaeus' role in the history of the early Hellenistic Macedonia, or if one is to accept the almost anonymous treatment of this king as a puppet. So the first question that comes to our mind is, what do we know about Philip III Aridaeus? He was the son of Philip II and his wife, Philina, from Larissa. And although we cannot speak of his youth, as mentioned, and whether if this was a normal childhood, Aridaeus was treated as part of the Argia dynasty. After Alexander's death in 323, the conflicts about the succession were settled by the consensus that Aridaeus, who had been acclaimed under the name Philip III, thus stressing his descent with the Argian family, was recognized as king together with Alexander's presumed son by the pregnant barbarian princess Roxanne. Evidently, Macedonians found themselves to be the subjects of two kings, one an adult and the other an infant. Still, it was Perdiccas, one of Alexander's generals who commanded the royal army. His authority in Asia was unquestioned and wherever he went, he had Philip Arideus follow like a mute in the play, as Plutarch describes him. After the settlement at Babylon in 322, the two kings, namely Philip III Arideus and the newborn baby by Roxanne, were always accompanying the army and their regent, Perdiccas. Decrees were made in their names, buildings dedicated, decisions made. That year, 322, soon after they became kings, Kinani, Alexander the Great half-sister, came to Asia to arrange the marriage of her daughter, Adair, to Arideus. When Perdiccas tried to prevent it by having Kinani murdered, the infuriated Macedonian troops supported the marriage. Adair, now wife of Philip Arideus, was renamed Eurydice. Later that year, the aged viceroy of Macedonia, Antipater, decided to move the kings, their court, and a royal army to the homeland. We do not know how, and mostly if, Arideus was acting as a king in Macedonia. During Antipater's, the regent's last illness, according to the sources, Antipater appointed one of Alexander's generals, Polyperchon, as manager of the kings. Polyperchon disregarded Antipater's dying words and sent for Olympias, Alexander the Great's mother, asking her to undertake the management of the infant son of Alexander and stay in Macedonia, having the dignity of a royal position. Olympias accepted the invitation, but her involvement was attended by dangers. Somehow, we don't know when, and we don't know exactly uh, the, the tricks they used, Athea Eurydice, together with her husband, King Philip, slipped out from Polyperchon's control, and when Eurydice heard that Olympias was preparing for a return to Macedonia, she reacted. Eurydice, though barely out of her teens, exactly because of her marriage and the incapacity of her husband, was able to wield great power and influence, and she had somehow assumed the management of the kingship. About early fall of 317, having sized the regency in the name of her, the king, her husband, she sent an order to Polyperchon to surrender his army to Cassander. The dual monarchy had split, and in the early fall of 317, 
Adea Eurydice and Philip III were in Macedonia. Last was the confrontation with Olympias, who also had gathered a strong army. And on the eve of that battle, the Macedonians decided to desert Philip Aridaeus and his wife Eurydice and side to Olympias. Aridaeus and his wife were arrested immediately and they were kept in prison under such appalling conditions that Olympias began to lose favor with the Macedonians. Sometime in September 317, some Thracian soldiers stabbed Philip III to death and sent to Eurydice a sword, a noose, and a dose of poison with the order to kill herself. Eurydice, a girl of 19 years, washed the corpse of Philip so that it was ready for burial and then hanged herself with her girdle. Alexander, I'm sorry, Philip III, Aridaeus, and his wife, Adea Eurydice, were given a royal burial at Aie by Cassander later in 316. We will come to our last uh, paragraph in this ceremonial burial. This is the historical context. What do the sources tell us about Philip III? All sources seem to confirm his mental disability. They portray him as incapable of handling his own affairs. Some of the sources, which mention Aridaeus, portray him as merely a puppet maneuvered by others. Several, however, describe his handicap. These all speak in terms of mental problems. Diodorus, for example, reports that Aridaeus had an incurable mental condition. Psychicis de pathesi, aniatis. Plutarch describes him three times as without reason, half wit, and no different than a child. While Appian states that he was irrational. And elsewhere, he names him as slow or stupid. Last, Justin refers to him once as beset by illness. While the sources attest Aridaeus's intellectual disability, the descriptions are too imprecise to know about its nature. I mean, whether it was syndromic or not. Plutarch mentions Aridaeus's infant-like behavior. It seems that Aridaeus's mental abilities were not normal. Based on the evidence, we can assume that he was able to follow quite complicated verbal exchanges and that he was not always passive and dutiful. Otherwise, Aridaeus is described as gentle, able to perform a public role's basic functions in public and religious ceremonies, but this was done when he was instructed and guided. Curtius mentions that Aridaeus actor, acted as Alexander's associate in sacrifices and ceremonies. No source suggests that his physical appearance was abnormal and his participation in those ceremonies implies that he had the ordinary physical skills of a man of his class and culture. The tale that Aridaeus was a healthy child until Olympias gave him mind-destroying drugs is probably a hostile retrospective fiction. However, it seems that Aridaeus's mental abilities were not normal as he had always had a guardian or a manager. Even the preference for a possible son of the barbarian Roxanne gives us the impression that members of the Macedonian elite were treating Aridaeus with contempt, something characteristic about the low opinion of his capacities. In all instances, he is described to react in our sources, but in his reactions, he is always under the indirect influence of someone else. Perdikas, Antipater, Polyperchon, and finally, his wife, Adea, Adea Eurydice. Since he was not capable of ruling due to his mental handicap, it was obvious that he served his supporters as a hand puppet so that they could pull the strings under the guise of supervision or marriage. This is made obvious from all references to him. Despite efforts by some scholars to reassess his role in events after the death of Alexander the Great, I believe that Philip III Aridaeus was nothing more than a puppet king, therefore unable to rule. 
However, he survived for seven years, which is quite peculiar at first glance. Why didn't they get rid of him when they could? Why did they give him, why did they have him married with Adair? Something which could mean potential dynastic problems, provided that Adair Yuridiki would give birth to a male child. The answer, I believe, is to be sought, sought in the realization that whatever developments took place in Greece, the Aegean or Asia, Macedonia remained the vital center of the Argent family and the epicenter of worship by the average Macedonian. Acts of state were published there in the names of the kings. Their names were associated with all those leading chiefs of the past in treaties and proclamations. The parties in the civil war were those loyal to the kings and those in rebellion against them. And finally, the Macedonian army had a deep loyalty to the royal family of Philip and Alexander. Aridaeus and his wife realized that only when they decided to confront Olympias, but then it was too late. Why was he abandoned after all by his troops before the battle against Olympias' army? The question I think has an easy answer. After seven years of Aridaeus on the throne, everybody had realized that he was unable to rule and that he was just a puppet at the hands of Perdikas, Antipater, and the others. He had no heir with Eurydice, as far as we know, while Alexander IV, the infant child of Roxanne and Alexander the Great, was by now a six-year-old child who had passed the critical period for children and infants and was an Argiad also. I have saved for the epilogue a comment on a puzzle concerning Aridaeus. Some 40 years after their proper burial by Cassander at Aegea, a band of mercenary Gauls dug up and sacked the royal cemetery. A few tombs seem to have escaped desecration, and two of these, along with the third partially destroyed tomb, were uncovered 45 years ago in 1977-78. The two double-chambered, barrel-vaulted, unplanted tombs discovered by Manuel Sandronikos have yielded a wealth of remarkable uh, and some exceptionally beautiful uh, objects. The interpretation of these discoveries have been a topic of fierce scholar scholarly debate. The greatest debate has been over the identity of the two occupants, a male and a female, of tomb two. That is, whether these are Philip II and Cleopatra, or Philip III, Aridaeus, and Adea Eurydice. Strong arguments have been made for both royal pairs, and despite scientific analysis of the bones, the debate continues. But this is perhaps the topic of another paper. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Xizopoulos. This was very, very interesting. And as we will have, uh, as in the other sessions or common discussion at the end of uh, this panel, I will proceed uh, immediately to our next speaker who um, in, um, who introduces us to Baldwin the Fourth, the Leper, and he puts the question uh, whether he's fit to rule but unfit to live enough. And uh, the speaker is uh, Professor Milos Stankovic, and I would uh, like to invite him to start his presentation. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to congratulate to all organizers, to all participants to the audience as well, who made this conference to be fit enough. Well, uh, Baldwin IV was the sixth king of Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, and he was son of King Amory, or King Amalric, however would you prefer, and the Countess of Courtenay, Agnès. Uh, when Amory was called to ascend the throne of his ancestors, he was led to divorce Agnès by the surgeon of the church, because the blood relationship be between the two was too close. In fact, it was fourth degree of blood relationship. Anyway, the legal status of their children or the right of Baldwin Ford to ascend the throne of Jerusalem after his father's death have never arose. As a boy, Baldwin was an excellent student, extremely gifted and handsome with perfect memory and decency. Unfortunately, this angevin developed the first symptoms of leprosy 
as a child, which was discovered by his teacher, William of Tyre, who was one of the greatest historians and chroniclers of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, but who used to be official as well. He was Archdeacon of Tyre, and he was uh, King's Chancellor. Uh, William wrote about Baldwin, about Baldwin. Uh, in fact, he took care, he started to take care about him and his upbringing when Baldwin was nine years old, and at once he, he noticed, uh, this is a citation, he was playing one day with his companions of noble rank when they began, as playful boys often do, to pinch each other's arms and hands with their nails. The other boys gave evidence of pain by their outcries, but Baldwin, although his comrades did not spare him, endured it altogether too patiently, as if he felt nothing. After this he had occurred several times, it was reported to me. At first, I suppose that it proceeded from his capacity for endurance and not from lack of sensitiveness. But when I called him and began to inquire what it meant, I discovered that his right arm and hand were partially numb, so that he did not feel pinching or even biting in the least. The lad's father was informed of this condition, and physicians were consulted. Repeated fermentations, oil rubs, and even poisonous remedies were employed without resulting in attempt to help him. For, as we recognize in process of time, these were the preliminary symptoms of a most serious and incurable disease, which later became plainly apparent. End of citation. Well, during the Middle Ages, developing leprosy was seen as a disaster, because this disease can lead to ulceration and deformity of the face, hand, feet, and skin elsewhere. Many were feared of developing the same disease after contact with the sick person. On the other side, there were strong religious overtones of impurity and sin associated with leprosy. Nobles of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, diagnosed as having leprosy, were obliged to join a specific military old order. It was uh, order of St. Lazarus, and in fact it was established by a liberal roi. It was the first codification of field of law in Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, but it was enacted even after Baldwin's death. On the other hand, uh, well, considering the others, they were segregated into leprosarium, but not Baldwin, who, when his leprosy was progressed, rejected the royal court wish to lead a tranquil life in retirement. Perhaps the word of William of Tyre explained how it was even possible that Baldwin Fort, who could not have offspring, was crowned king as 13 years old boy, it happened in 1174, after the death of his father, Amalric of Jerusalem, and ruled the kingdom of Jerusalem until his death. Upon Amalric's death, the Hyde Court convened to discuss the succession. The High Court must have been aware of the royal physician, uh, physician's suspicions that Baldwin had contracted leprosy, but he had not yet been diagnosed officially. Otherwise, it would have been a significant impediment to his ascendancy to the throne. Finally, in medieval times, there were many infectious diseases which consequenced the similar symptoms like leprosy did. Uh, it appears that up to that point, the problems had been limiting to the loss of sensation in Baldwin's right arm. That is one possible explanation. Yet there was no viable alternative, because Baldwin was the king's only son. But it will be shown that it was the best choice at the moment. In his defense of his kingdom, he achieved incredible results. In 1176, with his 15, Despite having use of only one hand in a raid of Beka Wali, in modern times this is Lebanon, he led his army and he defeated the garrison of Damascus, forcing Saladin to abandon his campaign to Aleppo. Next year, in 1177, in the famous Battle of Monjiza, he found himself at the head of crusaders who achieved one of the greatest Christian victories in the Latin East, inflicting a disastrous defeat on Saladin, who barely survived. In 1182, Baldwin's outnumbered army 
again won Saladin's army in the Battle of La Forbele. Bernard Hamil Hamilton attributes the victory to the respect and loyalty commanded by Baldwin, who stayed on the battlefield despite his illness and intense heat. Finally, in 1183, although having become blind and immobile, Baldwin defeated Saladin near Karak. He went and led his troop in a little slung between two horses. In foreign policy, Baldwin supported Nuruddin's successors, the Atabegs of Aleppo and Mosul. Uh, deepening the Muslim discord, King's goal was to continue the old policy of his ancestors on the throne of Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, uh, trying to strengthen the position of Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem as a kind of regulator of, of relations in, in Near East, in Orient. The circumstances of eternal politics were such that Baldwin lived and fought with Saladin surrounded above, all by decadent Christian nobility. He himself was gradually losing the battle with leprosy, and everyone was waiting for his death for years to benefit from it. This may explain how Baldwin, although obviously a leper in his last years, remained king until his death. His sisters married insignificant and incompetent nobles, and his mother took care only of her own interest. He was not strong enough to prevent her sister Sybilla to marry Guy of Lysignan, and yet Baldwin was strong enough to remove Guy from regency of Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, where he had appointed him only a few months before. Baldwin neither was strong to force his vassal, Reynold of Châtillon, to keep trust the king signed with Saladin, or to convince this nobleman to make restitution to Saladin, because Reynold sees a merchant caravan on its way from Egypt to Damascus. But Baldwin was tolerant and rational to help Reynold's defense against Saladin, knowing that he protects the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem at whole, as a whole in this way. So William of Tyre noted the following as well. Although physically weak and impotent, yet mentally he was vigorous and far beyond his strength, he strove to hide his illness and support the cares of the kingdom. The Muslim scholar Imad al-Din was surprised by this. In spite of Baldwin's illness, the Franks were loyal to him. They gave him every encouragement, being satisfied to have him as their ruler. They exalted him. They were anxious to keep him in office, but they paid no attention to his leprosy, wrote Imad al-Din. In affirming that Baldwin forebore the legislature, uh, one may immediately uh, treats on shaky ground. The principal evidence is found in the oath that later kings of Jerusalem and Cyprus, starting from 1191 and uh, 98, I beg your pardon, swore at their coronation. Les assises du royaume et du rey Amaoui et du rey Baudouin son fils, et les anciens coutumes et assises du royaume de Jérusalem garderaient. It seemed that Baldwin's uh, legislative work is to be found in less extensive works than complete codes. But according to John Lamont, there is at least one law that can be credited to Baldwin Fort. It is the Assise du Coup Papahan, which is given in full by Philip de Noir, who as well was one of the greatest jurists of Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. Baldwin died in 1185, in age of 24. He was a king who had the misfortune of being a leper, and the leper who had the fortune of being a king. His deeds testified that although a leper, he was not only capable, but suitable of ruling as well. Unfortunately, he could not live enough to prevent the decline of his kingdom. While Baldwin was on the throne, his kingdom was preserved. It lost no territory and flourished economically and spiritually. In long terms, his consent and marriage of his sister Sibylla with Guy of Lysignan indicated not only the fall of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which occurred about a century later, but it influenced the change of accession to the throne of the Kingdom of Jerusalem and the affirmation of the hereditary principle as well, which was definitely established in the 13th century. Last but not least, Baldwin's successful reign, which demonstrated that those with leprosy could still make a useful contribution to the society, 
may have led to a lesser stigmatization of the illness in the 13th century kingdom of Jerusalem. By the 13th century, the order of St. Lazarus began to include healthy knights on its ranks and leprosaria for both and men, uh, for both men and women in Acre were located inside city walls and no longer isolated outside. The order was even given the responsibility of defending a section of the city walls of Acre. In that way, the memory of Baldwin, the leper king, as one of the most prominent personalities of the Middle Ages, remains alive until today. In that sense, symbolically, Baldwin IV, the leper and the martyr, was buried in the church of the Holy Sepulchre next to the tomb of our Lord. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Stankovic, for uh, this uh, great overview. And we have seen, um, I think it's, it's really very interesting to have seen the capat uh, capability to rule in, sp uh, in spite of uh, being, uh, um, being ill, having this uh, grave disease. And I think this fits very good in discrepance to the before, um, to, to the uh, lecture before by Professor Xisopoulos, when we have seen the mental problems uh, making someone unfit to rule. And now uh, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, our third speaker of this panel. It's Konstantinos Diados, uh, coming also from uh, Aristoteles University of Thessaloniki. And he will uh, speak on deformity as a qualification. And he will introduce us uh, to the case of Byzantine court Eunuchs. Constantina, the floor is yours. The theme of this presentation concerns the eunuchs of the Byzantine court. court. Okay. It will examine how their mutilation and the after effect physical consequences were decisive for their entry into court and the major factor in their exercise of power. For this reason, the legal framework regarding castration will be laid out, as well as a brief examination of the medical effects of castration in order to outline their complex profile. Then, through selected examples, I will attempt to highlight the causes of the eunuch's right to rise to power and its evolution through time until their final removal from the political scene. Eunuchs in power were already a distinctive feature of the Roman Empire, but it was during the early Byzantine era that they were elevated to a powerful political elite. It was during that time that they became an institutionalized and integral part of the court and its function. The first question that immediately arises is why the emperor was so much in need to surround himself with eunuchs. The main reason comes from the fact that according to Byzantine political tradition, body integrity and soundness of limb were of key importance for someone to raise aspirations for the Byzantine throne. The emperor, as the mirror of heavenly authority, had to be able-bodied. Uh, we must now stress that Byzantine law prohibited castration strictly, imposing exemplary sentences on the offenders. Constantine the Great's law, probably dated in 337, prescribed the death penalty for those who conducted such operations. In case the castrated male was a slave, he, along with the place where the crime was committed, were confiscated. The same sentence for castrators was retained until the Justinian era. Justinian's novel 142, uh, probably dated in 558, prescribed castration as the penalty for the offenders. If the offender somehow survived the procedure, he was sentenced to forced labor for life and his property was confiscated. The legal framework was maintained until the reign of Leo VI, who reduced the sentence to a monetary sanction and exile for 10 years for the abettor. If the abettor was an official, he would then be removed from office. As for, as for the castrator, he was firstly whipped and then he had his head saved. Then, after confiscation of his property, he was exiled for 10 years as well. In case the castrated male was a slave and the procedure was carried out against his will, he would be released. However, provisions of the same law 
permitted for the first time castration procedures for unstated medical reasons and thereby laying the groundwork for legitimate castrations within the Byzantine borders with implications that we'll examine later on. An antithesis now can be easily noticed. On one hand, the strict laws that forbade castration and on the other hand, the Byzantine court that based its function almost entirely on eunuchs. The reason for this can be traced in the acknowledged and permanent need for eunuchs for the or or orderly functioning of the palace. Realizing, however, that the powerful position of eunuchs at court could lead to extensive castrations within the empire, both for speculative and social advancement reasons, the Byzantine state wanted to curb such phenomena, since this would have resulted in a significant demographic hemorrhage. Now, uh, what were the reasons for castrating an individual? Primarily for profit. The prohibition of castration, combined with the increasing demand for eunuchs, caused a surge in their sale price, and their com commercial value could reach up to 70 gold coins. It was also common for a child, especially from the 9th century onwards, to be castrated at the, at the initiative of his parents in hope that he would follow a successful political or ecclesiastical career. Nevertheless, in practice, the reasons were often much humbler. Families, under conditions of absolute destitution, and in order to ensure the survival of their family, had their male children castrated and sold. Moreover, castration was implemented for crimes besides castration, such as bestiality, pedophilia, and homosexuality. In many cases, medical reasons were the cause, or at least the pretense for castration, all those sources do not clarify the type of illness that required the removal of genitalia as treatment. A special case was undoubtedly the phenomenon of self-castration, where males castrated themselves in an attempt to tame their passions for the sake of their faith. Unicism also served a political purpose. As mentioned above, castration excluded permanently someone from the Byzantine throne. That was, for example, the case of Vasilios Lekapinos, the legitimate son of Emperor Romanos II, who was castrated in order to get disqualified from the throne. However, what differentiated castration from other political mutilations was the fact that castration, besides excluding from the imperial office the castrated individual, it also eliminated his uh, entire blood, bloodline in the uh, long run due to the removal of the ability to procreate. Castration, this for being a prohibited practice, was extensively discussed in the medical textbooks, textbooks of the time. Paul of Egina, a Byzantine physician and surgeon of the 7th century, provides a detailed description of the castration techniques, where were performed in a twofold manner, by compression of the testicles, mostly performed in infancy, and by excision. Regardless of the technique used, castration had a significant effect on the body structure of the eunuch, due to hypogonadism, a disorder caused by the lack of testosterone, the hormone essential for the formation of androgenetic properties and characteristics. The eunuch, among other things, uh, showed lack of facial hair and a distinctable high-pitched voice. Here you can see the whole list. Uh, you can see here the whole list. Therefore, uh, the basic characteristics of the Byzantine court eunuch describe a castrated male with a distinctive physical appearance, no families and social connections due to his foreign origins, who was a priori incapable of claiming the throne for himself and the condition sine qua non for the function of the court. During the early Byzantine era, a wide range of honorary titles and offices were reserved only for eunuchs with duties mostly, if not exclusively, were related to the operability of the palace and the overview of the imperial quarters. Dominating figure amongst palace eunuchs was Prepositus Sacri Cubiculi, who was in charge of the imperial chambers, the imperial vestry, and supervised the numerous eunuch chamberlains. For example, Ioannis Malalas, referring to Rothanos, who was Prepositus of the Emperor Valens, rightfully so, describes him as a commander of the palace. Prepositus also held the ninth, the ninth highest rank among Byzantine officers, according to Notitia Dignitatum Pars Orientis, and in the absence of the emperor from Constantinople, the administration of the state was assumed by Prepositus together with the magistrate and the city prefect. 
Although many offices were designated for Unix, they weren't exclusive, excluded from other offices as well. For example, Ephtropius, the notorious prepositus, who rose to prominence during the reign of Emperor Arcadius, was the first and the last eunuch to ever appoint it as consul. Controlling access to the per emperor's person and having daily personal contact with him was the main source of the court eunuch's power. As a result, they were rarely confined to the limits of their office and exercised ad hoc extended powers, the exercise of which the emperor was afraid to entrust to other officials, especially in the military area, to avoid potential rebellious movements by generals who would seek to redeem their reputation and attempt to usurp the throne. Narcisse, for example, was without question the most successful eunuch military commander. A trusted eunuch of the Emperor Justinian relieved Belisarius of his command in Italy and despite his lack of military experience, he was able to repeatedly defeat the Goths and effectively complete the reconquest of Italy. Eunuchs were also used as scapegoats. They were often credited with the failures of the empire. Their alleged weak and effeminate character provided an easy target for their impugners. The extent of their power was determined by their relationship with the emperor and the emperor's personality. But their source of power worked also as a double-edged sword. If their trusting relationship was compromised in any way, the eunuch was often forcefully removed from the political scene, and in many cases that meant also his physical extermination. When a new emperor ascended the throne, Frequently, he replaced the eunuchs of the palace with new ones that he could trust. Such was, for example, the case of Emperor Julian, who, upon his ascendance, replaced the court eunuchs and executed the previous prepositus. So, it was for the court eunuchs' advantage to protect the emperor's interest, as those two, at that time, were seemingly intertwined. Their unique appearance made them also a structural part of the imperial ceremonies. In numerous ceremonies, eunuchs accompanied the emperor and acted, acted as intermediaries between the emperor and the real world. A typical example was the exclusive presence of court eunuchs when the emperor invested or divested himself of the imperial insignia. Also, their angel-like image surrounded the emperor with a mystical aura that symbolized the union of the heavenly court of God with the earthly court of the emperor. During the Middle Byzantine period, the number of court eunuchs increased and their political power expanded even more. According to Vita Vasili, Danielis, an old and rich widow, widow from Peloponnese, coming to Constantinople, offered the emperor Vasilios I rich gifts, and I quote, no one until then had ever introduced to the king of Romans. Among the things, uh, the gifts received by Vasilios, were a hundred eunuchs, since Danielis was aware both of the fertile ground in the empire, the empire for eunuchs and of their great number, which resembled the number of flies that swarm around sheep in summer. Their numerical growth is mainly attributed to a combination of two reasons. Firstly, the legal right for parents to castrate their children on medical grounds, based on the above stated Leo VI legislation. However, the main reason can be identified in the reflexes of the Byzantine society that foresaw an opportunity for social advancement not only for the castrated individual, but for his family as well. Their increasing political power was also mirrored in the number of titles and offices that were exclusively reserved for eunuchs. According to, according to Clitorologion of Philotheos, a list of offices and court presidents that was written in 899, the number of offices and titles reserved for eunuchs grow even larger. Most notably, in terms of power, Repositus handed over the reins of power to Parachimomenos, who from now on would be the most powerful eunuch in the palace. The change in terms of numerical growth had a catalytic effect on their increase of power. From the late 8th century onwards, for the first time, we noticed the emergence of contending dipoles in the high echelons of the court eunuch's hierarchy. Court eunuchs struggled among themselves to prevail from influence uh, over the emperor or the empress. Such was, for exa example, the case of the eunuch Stavrakios and Aetios during the reign of Empress Irene, which was described by Theophanes as the dispute of the, dispute of the eunuchs. Their enmity escalated as Irene's health deter deteriorated, with Stavrakios as the final victor. Realizing the potential danger that could arise from having Aetius removed from her side, 
the Empress forbade the military officials to communicate with him in any way because he knew by that time that the assistance of a court eunuch was decisive for the success or the failure of, an in, of, an, uh, rebe of a rebellion. Thus, in many cases, court eunuchs ceased to be a guarantee of protection for the emperor and became a potentially destabilizing factor. Adapting to political reality and realizing their expendability, they would often go against legitimacy. When, for example, Romanos II ascended the throne in 959, he dismissed Parakimomenos Vasilios Lekapinos and replaced him with a eunuch Yosif Vrigas. As a result, a feud started between the two eunuchs. The emperor died unexpectedly in 963, and his sons Vasilius and uh, Cosardinos ascended the throne, while Vrigas, due to their young age, exercised de facto absolute power. When Kiforos Phokas was proclaimed em emperor in the same year and wanted to enter Constantinople to become emperor, Vrigas openly opposed this development. Phokas then, affiliated with Vasilius Lekapinos, who was able to arm 3,000 men in support of the new emperor. In the street battles that followed, Vrigas was defeated and subsequently exiled. Their native descent, combined with the existence of social and family ties, enabled and motivated eunuchs to promote the interests of their own family. At the height of their power in the 11th century, they were able to regulate the imperial succession for the benefit of their family. Most notably, Ioannis Orphanotropos, a powerful eunuch during the reign of Romanos III, succeeded on two occasions in elevating his relatives to the throne. First, his brother Michael IV, and then his nephew Michael V. With the rise of the Comnenian dynasty, a family-based model of power was adopted in which eunuchs had no place. Nevertheless, until the end of the empire, they remained a distinct element of the Byzantine society. <laughs> to sum up, uh, Byzantine court eunuchs rose to prominence mostly due to their castration. Legal framework of the early period ensured to an extent their foreign origins and the subsequent absence of social ties. Court eunuchs at that time protected the interests of the emperor as they knew that in case of a change in the imperial office, they would be removed from palace. The gradual alteration of these basic characteristics beyond castration, number, and origins during the Middle Byzantine era led to the cessation of the so called perfect service of the court eunuch. They abused their power and often posed a potential threat for the emperor. Maintenance of social ties caused, caused court eunuchs to advance the interest of their own families instead of the emperors. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for this uh, really fascinating uh, course through the uh, power and the uh, status of the Santime eunuchs and i think and with this i want to open uh, the discussion i think especially in this panel we have a lot of cross references between all the three uh, participations beginning from the mental disease disqualifying for the office of ruler but on the other uh, side the mental strength being a high quality for ruling in spite of a disqualifying physical uh, condition and uh, in the end the physical mutilations not always being a case of penalty but sometimes also a, a very big starting point for a career at court and um, with this, I now want to open the discussion and um, ask for questions for the participants, for the uh, presentator, uh, presentators, and you also are, uh, it's up to, to uh, ask questions to each other, of course. So, who wants to start? So, Nina, uh, I, I saw Nina, and then uh, the next question goes to you. Sorry. Uh, so, I'd like to thank all participants. I'd like to start with a question for Professor Xidopoulos. You mentioned in the end that uh, you presumed the soldiers were fed up with working for... 
a king who was a puppet king who was obviously unable to rule himself. Are there maybe some sorts of signs of disapproval or at least suspicion towards his abilities noticeable in the sources earlier? So I'm not talking about the people who already knew him well intimately, but of something like that being noticeable to the general public. Thank you for uh, the question. Indeed, uh, the Macedonian army uh, did have a very clear picture of uh, Aridaeus's disability, disabilities. But this was not the case, uh, I believe, because the Macedonian army had also uh, faced curious attitudes from former kings. Philip II, for example, tried to kill his own child during uh, Macedonian symposium. Mm -hmm. Alexander killed Cletus during another uh, unlucky moment. So I believe that it was a mixture. The Macedonians knew that Aridaeus was not capable. He, they knew also that he, didn't, he hadn't produced an heir to the throne with Eurydice. <laughs> Therefore, at the, same, and at the same time, the infant child was now six years old and under the protection of Olympias, who was Alexander the Great's mother. So they had to choose between two Argyats. They chose, I believe, wisely, on, with regards to the future of the Macedonian throne. Now, it is, of course, a paradox that Olympias, who was the protector of the child, uh, of the infant child, Alexander IV, actually killed him, murdered him a few months later. But at that moment, Aridaeus didn't provide his troops with any evidence or any proof that he could be a solemn king for Macedonia. Thank you very much. So the next question, please. Yes, it's also for Professor Xilopoulos. I would like to ask you whether we have any information or sources about the education given to Philippus Aridaeus, given the importance that was given to uh, Alexander's education with uh, Aristotle and whether he was able to get any? Uh, no, the answer is that we don't have any information regarding his childhood. Uh, and uh, since he was uh, half brother of Alexander, he is uh, usually in the shadow of his elder brother in the sources. However, we must assume, and this is a logical hypothesis, that he had also had the same kind of education in the royal court. After all, he was uh, living there. But this is just, uh, a log as I said, a logical hypothesis. We have no evidence whatsoever regarding his education. However, the arguments from the sources uh, could be used to, uh, to assume that he must have had some kind of higher education since he was also participating, as we saw, with his brother in uh, ceremonial uh, rituals. Uh, on the other hand, it seems that he was not uh, the number one preference of Philip II. Uh, and uh, this is made clearly in the sources, who actually call him Nothron. Nothros in Greek, in ancient Greek, means stupid. So. We have also the other uh, story, uh, providing it's true, although I said it's not, uh, with, from Plutarch, that Olympias gave him poison in order to make him mentally disabled. We really don't know. We are in, uh, in the dark, completely in the dark, regarding Philip Aretheus, but he, it seems that he was uh, something in between, not completely retarded, but not completely capable of ruling either. Thank you so much. Are there further questions? Maybe I'm allowed to put a question in the room about uh, the medical um, sources. Um, you've mentioned a lot of um, details uh, for making 
this uh, condition of the eunuch um, visible. Uh, but there are concrete medical sources describing uh, some forms of castration. You've mentioned also Paul of Agina. Would you explain a little bit uh, more about the, the techniques. yes, the techniques and how it is um, how it is um, um, thought about uh, in in uh, in kind medical medical ethics. Thank you for your question. Uh, Paul of Aignan describes the two methods by excision and by compression of the testicles. Uh, but at the beginning of uh, this chapter, he says that uh, although castration has not a positive effect on the castrate's body, they are forced by uh, powerful, powerful individuals to proceed uh, to castrate uh, somebody. Uh, having in mind that uh, Paul of Aigner lived in the 7th century mm -hmm. and castration was illegal in Byzantine uh, Empire until uh, the reign of uh, Leo VI, I suppose uh, he's referring either to political mutilations that we know they're already happening by that uh, time, uh, political castrations to be exact, or uh, castrations for lucrative uh, reasons. Uh, on describing that those techniques uh, by compression it was mostly performed in infancy, mm -hmm. where the, the baby mm -hmm. was put in hot water until his uh, flesh was warm, and then his testicles were crushed until the castrator couldn't feel, feel them anymore. Uh, and the excision is pretty self-explanatory, self it was by the cutting of the testicles. There was also a more violent uh, form of castration, but it was only used as punishment, uh, the so-called cavlocopisis, which was used in cases of uh, pedophilia and, uh, and uh, ho uh, homosexuality, when there was a total uh, removal of the genitalia. But in those cases, uh, I think the final purpose was the death of the castrated individual because they were castrated then public humiliated and I suppose later on they would die because even if it was done legia artis the procedure uh, we know from uh, from a novel of Justinian that uh, only three out of 90 uh, castrate, castrated males eventually survived the castration thank you so much this is really interesting to have the different forms uh, of performing this procedure fitted to uh, the purpose, whether it's a penalty or whether it's uh, due to steps uh, to make a making career at, at court. And this is really a very interesting um, difference. Um, are there further questions? Yeah, Sahari. And then uh, John, please. Thank you to all the presenters. Uh, I also have a question about Byzantine eunuchs, or sort of more of a comment, I guess. Uh, Leo VI also, uh, as far as I recall, he discusses whether eunuchs can marry. And it's something that he, yeah. And the question, the question is, uh, can someone who can't produce children uh, be married? Um, and I think that that, uh, that of course, is uh, one of the reasons that, uh, that would have prevented a eunuch from ever occupying the Byzantine throne, right? That they can't produce children. And um, even adoption, I think, is, is also uh, somewhat problematic. Could you talk a little bit about what the Six says about marriage adoption, that sort of thing? It's an interesting perspective. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor, for your question. Uh, in Byzantine law, there were three types of eunuchs, spadones, Filivie and, cast and uh, castrates, ectomie. Uh, one, of the, one of these describes the method that was used. For, for tomie, uh, the, the inability to procreate was sure. But as Paul of Egina describes in his medical textbooks, for Flavie, there was some percentage of failure of the, of the procedure. So they could have still some capabilities. So, uh, when uh, Leo VI uh, uh, forbade castrates 
to marry, and simultaneously gave them the right to adopt, because he think he thought that uh, the purpose of the marriage was the procreation, and in allowing eunuchs to marry, th this would be an insult to nature. So uh, until then they were, and if the Slavie, uh, someone who was castrated by compression, uh, couldn't have uh, children in two years' time, the wife could annul the marriage. Thank you. So we have two more questions. The first is by uh, John Baines, and the second is uh, you. Uh, I was struck by what you said about um, the demographic implications of castration, because that sounds to me like a rather unrealistic objection to it, because this was a very, very small proportion of people. So is this, in fact, an ideological point rather than one that is really about demographics? I will give you an example that in Paphlagonia, in the Middle Byzantine period, there was a uh, uh, starvation. So, I, according to Kedinos, I, I think, the, uh, they castrated their children and sold them in order to survive. So, it was a, a practice that was, uh, the eunuchs were so many, the demand was uh, very increased. And, uh, to understand that, there was regions outside the Byzantine borders that undertook uh, castration procedures in order to meet this demand. There were so many castrations that Justinian sent an envoy or with a eunuch, I don't know why, uh, to Abkhazia, a, a region in, Georg in today's Georgia, when he asked the, uh, the king to stop the castrations because there were so many. means that it, uh, at the elite, well, the, your point about Paphlagonia is different, but at the elite level, presumably, people were, were afraid that elites would be affected more than the population as a whole. Would that be right or not? Can you repeat please, your question? Uh, so, uh, would, would the concern about, uh, about there being too many castrations be more to do with um, people who would join the elite or the wider population? Not only the, the court eunuchs, because eunuchs as a social group were uh, uh, integrated at large in Byzantine society. They were patriarchs, they were uh, monasteries reserved exclusively for eunuchs, and they were uh, a very so distinctive social group in uh, Byzantine uh, society. Well, I would have one question in general, and more of a comment and a question, and then a short question for Professor Stankovic. The general comment and question is that in the spirit of the unfit to rule conference, the second topic that ties all of the lectures together is the sterility or the inability to produce heirs. So the inability to produce heirs was one of the indication, as I gathered from Professor Xidopoulos, that Philip III wasn't all there. He wasn't completely fit to rule. And the only reason that John the Eunuch in the 11th century was so powerful at the Byzantine courts uh, the Byzantine court, I'm sorry, uh, was because of the two empresses, Zoe and Theodora, not being able to produce any children. So whomever was the designated heir of the adopted son, or in fact the husband of the empress, would then have the best claim to the, the Byzantine throne. And if any of the lecturers, and in fact the keynotes, would like to comment on that, together with the afflictions of Michael IV and some other topics, and the short question for uh, Professor Stankovic is, uh, you talked about Baldwin and the leper uh, being almost universally uh, accepted as a ruler in spite of his affliction. Uh, was there any time or any uh, movement or kind of revolt against him that was based around his inability to rule, or in fact that someone was asserting that even though he was accepted previously, that he or his uh, advancing condition made him unable to rule? Well, should I answer Yes, first? I think okay. you, uh, you shall start, please. Okay. okay, thank you very much for your question. Well, uh, in context of your first, first question, it was clear that Baldwin IV um, was unable to produce offsprings 
but uh, it was not a problem for a society and for elites in Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, because as I have already mentioned, all of them somehow uh, had a hope that some of the representative or some of the structures would be in position to, to come to the throne. Reynold Chatillon or a mother of uh, Bolden the Fourth or his uncle, Ostas, etc. Uh, well, uh, before the end of his life, uh, being uh, uh, completely ill uh, and unable uh, effectively to rule the kingdom, uh, he has designated uh, his sister's son, Bolden V, um, for his hair on the throne. Uh, but unfortunately, Bolden V uh, was ruler less than a year. Uh, considering the second question, uh, there were no such movements in Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, and uh, Baldwin uh, Fort was really admired, uh, not only uh, by the elites, but uh, as well uh, as, a, as a, well, symbol of crusaders and their army. And before the end of his life, it was literally enough for him uh, to be brought by someone other and to come to the battlefield to encourage all the others who fought against Muslims and against Saladin as well. And somehow they were threatened just, just uh, with his appearance. Um, and in that sense, uh, well, all of them, I suppose, uh, were completely aware that his life will not uh, last a long time. So maybe it was one of possible explanations for what uh, there were no sudden kind of revolts or rebellions or something against him. Uh, well, that, that, if I can remember everything that, that you intend to ask, I hope that I try to give a lesser a or lesser, more complete answer. If I may add something. Yeah. Uh, I believe that Professor Stankovic's uh, paper uh, fits exactly as an argument about the inability of Philip III to rule. I mean, Baldwin IV was a leper, and despite this, he kept being uh, a king. His physical death only prevented him from anything else. While at the same time, Philip III was actually deserted by his troops. At the crucial moment of his uh, regal career, because they realized, the troops realized that they would fight for a king who was not capable of ruling. They wanted something else, they wanted something more stable. So they chose the infant, a king to be, instead of a mentally unfit to rule. Uh, well, if I can continue right now. Uh, in a part of a ruling of Bogdan IV, uh, he intended, and in fact, uh, he gave uh, a commandment of his army uh, to Guy of Lisignan, who was a bailey, in fact, who was a man uh, designated by him to rule the kingdom in his absence and during his incapability to do so. Uh, but uh, at first battle, it appeared that Guy of Lisignan was not able <clears throat> to command and to confront Saladin troops. And uh, uh, it, it has not passed a lot, a lot of time uh, while uh, Baldwin IV uh, took control over their army on himself. Uh, considering the fact about, about uh, rebellions, well, uh, they, uh, they didn't uh, make any kind of rebellions against him, but uh, we know for some examples of disobedience. For example, Reynold of Châtillon, who was uh, a very powerful vassal of, uh, of, uh, of the king uh, Baldwin IV, uh, he ruined the trust uh, which king made with Saladin, uh, attacking, as we, as, as we have seen, a caravan with traders and uh, with, uh, with the people uh, who just wanted to, to, to go to Mecca and Medina. And in fact, uh, when Bolden IV asked him and ordered him <clears throat> uh, to make a compensation to Saladin, 
in order to preserve peace, if it was possible, uh, he, 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 he didn't want to, to obey him, so he refused to do so. Uh, on the other side, there were some rumors uh, about, uh, if I may say, bad relations be between uh, Baldwin IV and uh, some other nobles. But uh, if we consider a whole situation uh, in which Baldwin IV was ruling, uh, we may say that it was more a consequence uh, uh, of his uh, illness and the consequence uh, uh, of the fact that uh, surrounded by different persons with different intentions, sometimes he didn't believe even to the closest. So we cannot say that some, some, some kind of uh, abandoning of the leper king, as Professor described in his, in his speech, was present here in Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. Thank you so much. And if I may, I would like to uh, comment very briefly to the first part of your question about the producing ears to the throne or the uh, question of the offspring. Uh, there is a problem uh, connected to this um, with emperors, Byzantine emperors, um, having uh, suffered from some kind of venereal diseases also. And we have a uh, still ongoing discussion around the fatherhood of Leon uh, VI, whether it was, uh, was uh, indeed Vasilius I uh, with his second wife, Ethiopia Ingerina, or maybe Michael III, um, who, uh, whose mistress also was Evdokia uh, Ingerina. So this is uh, somehow pending. And uh, it, is, it, it was always a question about presenting a ear to the throne. And so I think your uh, first part of the question was really uh, important. And it's also a problem not all um, uh, not also connected to Johannes of Anatolfos, but also connected to the Empress Zoe and her first husband, Romanos III Agios, because both were too old for producing years, for having offspring, and so they went uh, both to some physicians and trying out uh, iatromagical procedures and trying out amulets and a kind of ointments and a kind of, uh, but this was of course age uh, related infertility and there were no amulets helping uh, for this. And this was the big chance for Johannes of Anotorfos who saw his chance for this um, Empress Zoe being infatuated with uh, his younger brother Michael, um, who later became Michael uh, the Fourth, and who uh, later became uh, the second husband of Zoe. So these are uh, very related structures uh, related to the uh, not uh, to, uh, to the. Um, subject of being fit or unfit to rule, but fit or unfit to produce, uh, produce a, a, a near to the throne. Thank you for all the answers. Thank you so much for all these questions. Are there further questions, comments, and uh, if there are not, I'm uh, Yes, I'm very grateful to all the presenters and thank you all very, very much for your fascinating papers and also to the audience. Thank you all very much for your inspiring questions and for uh, going much. through this, uh, this panel you. together with us and with the presenters. And uh, then uh, I think I can close this session and we are, uh, and I hope also the online participants, <coughs> we all are enjoying um, yeah, a yeah. very uh, positive evening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much also. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Uh, I'm very sorry because there's something written in the chat I have really overlooked. Uh, it seems that my internet connection uh, is unsafe. Now this was uh, Professor Xidopoulos, but I think uh, it is it is cleared now because we we have talked to to uh, each other. Yes. Again, thank you so much, Nina. Are there some organizational things or? I think not. We don't have anything planned for this afternoon, so <laughs> you can rest a little. We're continuing tomorrow at the same time at 9.30. We're going to have Professor Kaliopi Bozdala's keynote lecture, which is also going to touch upon these subjects and blinding and everything. So I think we can continue in the same line. And tomorrow, after the conference is over in the afternoon, we're going to have the walk around town that was supposed to be held on Tuesday, but it rained.